Good evening. I'm Nina Hoffman, Executive Vice President of National Geographic, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the world premiere screening of The President's Photographer, 50 years inside the Oval Office, airing on PBS the night before Thanksgiving, and in case you're not aware of Turkey Day, it's Wednesday, November 24th is the day before Thanksgiving. We're excited that there are so many people who appreciate photography in the audience tonight and are here celebrating Photo Week DC. For 50 years, presidential photographers have acted as visual historians, and they have covered it all. Upheaval, tragedy, joy, often developing friendships with the presidents they serve. No day is the same for these photographers. Whether they are aboard Air Force One, backstage at the State of the Union, or in the heart of the West Wing. National Geographic's John Bedar, an esteemed colleague, is the executive producer of the film you're about to see, and the author of the companion book. And since I'm the president of the book division, I'm going to shamelessly hold it up. <laughs> this is, the, and it's a great book. After the screening, John will moderate a panel discussion with some of those who have served as chief White House photographers. We'll invite President Ford's chief photographer, David Hume Kennerly, the first President Bush's photographer, David Valdez, President Clinton's photographer, Robert McNeely, and President George W. Bush's photographer, Eric Draper, to the stage after you meet them in the movie. Then they'll answer your questions after the show. Regretfully, absent tonight is Pete Sousa, President Obama's photographer, who is currently on assignment in India. They'll also be signing books tonight in the lobby. And now it gives me great pleasure to invite John Bedard to the stage to introduce the film. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nina. Welcome to everyone. It's so exciting to uh, have a big crowd here, and I'm sure that is especially shared by um, our filmmaking team, who I'll get a chance to introduce a little later in the program. Um, as a way of introducing the film tonight, I wanted to briefly recognize uh, a couple of people. Um, these are, I would call, our White House contingent tonight. Um, first, I want to introduce White House photo editor and assistant director of the White House photo office, Alice Gabriner. Alice, you're out there somewhere. She's way, <laughs> fittingly, she's way in the back. Not a seeker of attention. Well, Alice has the daunting task of looking at every single image that the photographers take. And uh, this is, was critical to the filmmaking team in actually putting the show together. And we're eternally grateful for your help, Alice. Thank you very much. We're also lucky tonight to be joined by one of the currently working White House photographers, Lawrence Jackson. Lawrence, you're out here somewhere. Also way out in the back. You find that, that these people are naturally retiring. They, they try to stay out of the limelight. Um, I also wanted to introduce Janet Phillips. Janet's here somewhere. Janet is the, uh, she's the uh, archivist, the person who has to manage unbelievable volumes of photographs. And Janet is interesting because she's also the institutional memory for the White House photo office. She has worked there since the Reagan administration. And so this woman has seen a lot of presidential photos and was also invaluable both in the film and, uh, and um, in the book. Um, and as Nina mentioned, I mean, at this point, I would recognize the chief photographer himself. But part of the problem of being the chief photographer is that your life is not your own, as you will find in the movie tonight. So fittingly, Pete is, as Nina mentioned, on assignment with the president in India. Um, I think, but I'm not sure, and I don't want to embarrass her because I've not met her, that somewhere in this crowd is Pete's sister. But I'll, I'll let that remain a mystery. So without further ado, let, we'll watch the film. Then afterwards, we'll, we'll meet the filmmakers and uh, who, who made the film and the photographers who make up the heart of our story. Thank you very much. So, I think we're on here. So before, uh, before we start the q and I, uh, I just want to recognize the team that uh, made that remarkable film. Uh, first, I want to recognize the remarkable director of photography who shot the film, Aaron Harvey. Aaron, can you stand up? 
Over the course of, yeah, amazing job. Over the course of six months, Aaron did his best imitation of Pete Souza, covering him the way Pete covers the president. And the results are obvious. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Aaron's amazing work was carefully and thoughtfully edited by Penny Trounce. Where's Penny? Our editor. <laughs> Penny spent 12 weeks putting together a combination of run and gun coverage from Aaron, interviews, archival materials, weaving the amazing still photography of all of these photographers and Pete into a riveting whole. But none of it could have happened without our producer, writer, director, Jody Shalira. Jody. <laughs> Jody somehow, she somehow figured out how to go into an incredibly charged environment, and filming in the West Wing is a lot like filming on the deck of an aircraft carrier, where she captured amazing impromptu moments in the field without making anybody angry, because if you do, it's over. She then brought these moments back into the edit room, knit them together in a dr into a dramatic tale. She takes great care in taking care of her people. I've never worked with anyone who treats their crew better than Jody does. Congratulations on a landmark documentary. <laughs> now to the panel. So if I may, just briefly, I mean, you've met them already, but I'll just briefly do a quick intro, if you don't mind. So down there at the end, David Hume Kennerly. David won the Pulitzer Prize for photography when he was only 25 for his coverage of the Vietnam War. Two years later, he left Time Magazine to work for Gerald Ford. Bob McNeely, next in line there, who's also a Vietnam vet. First worked in the White House under President Carter, but he became White House, the chief White House photographer for the Clintons, uh, for President Clinton, where he worked from 93 to 98. Next to him is Eric Draper. Eric is the only chief presidential photographer to work two entire terms. I don't know how he's still standing <laughs> after he did that, considering how grueling it is. His wire service photo skills were put to the test, as you saw through 9-11 and the beginning of both the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And David Valdez, closest to me here, first worked as Vice President Bush's photographer, and then he moved to the White House when President Bush was elected, and he covered the president from 88 to uh, 93. So um, I thought I would cheat and ask the first question, um, and then we can open it up, because I'm sure there are lots of questions out there, and that is, all of you cultivated this amazing access. And David, maybe you could take this first, David Kennerly. And that is, were you ever asked not to take a picture? <laughs> well, uh, my, you saw what happened to Ollie Atkins, and, and I, I knew um, that I didn't want to be like Ollie, and so the night that, uh, President Ford took office. I was over at his house in Alexandria, and we talked about the White House photo job, and uh, he wanted to know how I saw the job, and I said, well, uh, I want to work directly for you and have total access. And um, I was sitting alone with him in his living room, and he kind of looked at me and said, you don't want Air Force One on the weekends? And <laughs> But he lived up to that. Uh, I took the job. He called me on the phone, offered it to me. Um, and I, there were two times he asked me not to come in before, and in both times, one time he was firing somebody, and then that, the other time he was chewing somebody out who happened to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And uh, it would have been embarrassing, but I was in every other meeting, uh, top secret meetings, whatever, uh, whenever. Was that, was that pretty routine for you guys that, you know, um, it was only something really sensitive? I think, Bob, you told me one story was kind of similar circumstances with President Clinton. Well, basically, it was uh, what the reference kind of back to what Pete said. There's a shock, and, and Obama felt it, and Clinton felt it. About the second day, he looked at me, and it was kind of like I'd covered him through the campaign. I was the campaign photographer. And all of a sudden, I'm there attached to his hip and I don't leave, and I'm taking all these pictures, and he's kind of like, uh, is this the way it's going to be? And I said, well, I feel a, a big responsibility. I mean, this is history. 
Uh, this is a uh, this is your administration. This is everything that's going to go on, and I really don't want to miss anything. So, but if at some point it interferes with your thought process or your ability to work, just tell me, and, and I'll back off. And uh, I hate to sound you know like I'm repeating David, but it happened twice to me. Uh, Mogadishu he, when he was. Uh, after the, the incident with which became Black Hawk Down, going into that meeting, and I still went in and made a single frame. And actually, the only person that ever pulled a uh, Richard Nixon on me was Francois Mitterrand. Uh, there was a meeting of <laughs> all of the, the French president came. They went into the Oval. There was a group meeting. Everybody else went out. It was left with Clinton and Mitterrand sitting in the yellow chairs. And I was thinking to myself, great, I'll get a nice picture of the two of them. And Mitterrand's here, and Clinton's here. And, Mitterrand looks up at me and goes, like this. And I looked at Clinton, I'm like, what? And he goes, so very, very slowly, I took one more frame. And I, I went out, but. Uh. <laughs> How about you, Eric? Well, in my case, uh, uh, I had to learn a lot about George W. Bush. Uh, I covered him as a press photographer. And becoming the White House photographer, you're, you have access to every part of the president's life. So, uh, and so much access that I kind of found myself um, trying, trying to disappear as much as possible in terms of like, like just, just like uh, Bob said, I mean, you're, you're, you're always there. So uh, there were several times, especially um, some of the sensitive times in and around uh, the start of uh, the Iraq war where, uh, you know, all I had to do was get a look from the president and I knew I had to leave. Uh, and, and, and that's where, again, being around someone so much that I would read the, the nonverbal cues more than uh, me being told not to take pictures uh, because of the fact I didn't want uh, the president to engage me. I didn't want to be part of the meeting. So uh, that's how, that, that's what happened to me a lot. David, I think you had a, I think I remember you had a vice president story. Well, well, uh, for, for, fortunately for me, um, I, I worked for the vice president, and, and being on the vice president's staff, it's much smaller and a more intimate group. So, and I did that for many, many years. So I really got to know him, and and uh, actually, when he was vice president, uh, President Reagan uh, sent him down to uh, Cape Kennedy uh, when the space shuttle blew up. And um, it was a real shock, and and so we went down there, and and w walking uh, in this office building down at NASA, uh, I brought it up, and I said, Mr. President or Mr. Vice President, um, what do you think? Should should we take pictures here? Should we not? And 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 um, he, he never really responded to the the question. But you could tell in, in his face that, that it was, you know, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so I, I backed off from that, that one moment. But when you, when you see all of the millions of things that we've all done uh, and, and some of the really strong moments, you know, Eric was 9-11 and, and, and the great stuff he did and, you know, Pete's story that we just saw is incredible. Um, uh, you know, I lived through the Iraq War and, and, and the start of that, and getting called into the Oval Office to, to start photographing uh, that evening when the bombing started in Baghdad. You really yeah. know what you're in for. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to me, you, you guys, I mean, not surprising, but each one of you is completely dialed in on the, you know, nonverbal cues from, from these presidents. and. Uh, that's just an amazing ability. So I, th I think let's let's open it up to questions from uh, from the audience. I'm sure there are plenty here in the aisle. They'll they'll come with a microphone. There. Yes, um, during the Clinton years, uh, you know, Secret Service agents were subpoenaed to testify about what they heard, etc. So what are the rules of the road, and how did you deal with that? You know, very turbulent time and the rules of the road. All of you, with regard to what you might overhear? Well, basically, I, a couple times, uh, th there were, af especially after 94, uh, you know, the, the proverbial promised barrage of subpoenas showed up on various subjects. So, um, but basically, it's, it's just, 
it's something you cultivate in your career of uh, not not really cultivate your attention is so focused on the visual and I'm not a person who, who listens very well anyway just ask my wife <laughs> and um, ask, ask my friends <laughs> also <laughs> um, but you know so anyway but I I've always been focused so a couple times um, that I was called on different things and, and just real quick the Secret Service I think was uh, a judge ruled they didn't have to testify and when I would, I, I just, you know, it was, it was just, I had no idea. You know, I, I didn't listen, I didn't pay attention. And they, a couple times, subpoenaed my pictures for different things, and I had to uh, go in and do, uh, you know, did I take this, on what date did I take it, things like that. But, uh, no, it, it's, but we're not expected. I mean, it's something, it, it'd be a, uh, it'd be a shock to me to hear about a photographer that, that repeated something that he'd, he'd heard in a meeting. That's a, you know, David, I remember when, when we were talking in an, in an interview, um, you mentioned this kind of unwritten rule that um, everybody kind of follows, not just White House photographers, but people in the working press who are photo photojournalists. Is there kind of an unwritten rule that you don't, you, you don't uh, dish even to the reporter you're working with? Well, you know, tr tr trust is, is uh, um, the key for any White House photographer. If you develop that trust, then you can do it. If you were to ever lose that trust, you're out. But what, but what about beyond that, like, you know, a work, working press? Well, I, photographers are actually the uh, worst sources uh, anywhere. In fact, uh, on my gravestone, I want to have here lies the worst source in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, photographers don't talk. Uh, wire photographers, anybody, uh, the magazine guys and women, the, the people uh, who are privileged to, to go backstage at some point or, and, and photograph reality and what they hear, they keep to themselves. I don't know of any instance where uh, a photographer has shared something with a reporter. Uh, it's really almost unheard of and, and uh, um, it, it ruins your relationship w of trust and um, uh, that's just across the board. I, I think photographers are very trustworthy people and all they want to do is get a picture that tells a story but they don't have to put in the caption what somebody said. All right, all right. All right let's take some more questions from the, from the audience. Any other hands out there? Yeah, in the, in the way back there. <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for your incredible work. I mean, it's just amazing, and I hold all of you in very high esteem for your work. Um, I would like to ask you how much you're involved in the editing process beyond the shooting. Um, are you working with photo editors at the White House? I know there's a few that you pointed out here tonight. Are you saying, hey, make sure you look at that third frame I shot? I think it's the killer. Or are Probably you totally handing it over? That 500th frame. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, a wonderful photo editor, uh, the first term, uh, Mike Davis, and another great photo editor, uh, Jody Steck, in the second term. And photo editors are so important because as the White House photographer, you, I mean, you cannot look at every single frame. It's almost impossible to look at it carefully enough to examine the subtleties, uh, and, and having a great photo editor, editor is very important. And because it's it's the job of the White House photographer to to be there, to to spend the time to be there to to make the pictures. So uh, photo editors are very very important in the process. Yeah, I I would like to agree with that, and, and I think um, in this digital era, one of the one of the real casualties of of the new age uh, media are uh, editors. Um, e editing is a profession, and I got my Pulitzer Prize because. An editor in New York put this portfolio of pictures together for me. Um, photographers are generally not their own best editors. Uh, they, they, you get emotionally attached to the moment and all that, and you really need somebody sitting back and looking at your photographs and and seeing what's there without the attachment to it. It's one of the reasons the National Ge Geographic has a strong visual. Um, uh, history is because of editors as well as great photographers. I want to thank Aaron Harvey too for, for this work he did. It was really exceptional, really good. <laughs> All right, Aaron. Let's see. Yeah, right here on the aisle here. Here, here comes the mic. Uh, 
Have you ever been asked by the president to delete a photo or by a staff to delete a photo? That was a special reference to the Clinton times. <laughs> No. Yeah, they, they, the pictures were subpoenaed a lot. I mean, everyone knows the history. You know, they, they, they came in and went through the files a lot. But, uh, you know, it was just, the really, I mean, one of the things that, in the years since, I mean, since I've left there and I've been going back through the work and stuff and looking at it, um, it's been interesting to start looking and, and seeing the work that starts to come out and starts to be uh, more important over time. And, um, the idea that at the time there, there's one, I mean, obviously, th th there could be something happened that could be some ultimately incriminating photo. I mean, I don't know what it would ever be, and, and you know, we're not. So, but the point of these archives is that uh, in f a few years, or, or even at the short distance we've been from it, but more in, in 100 years or 50 years, when historians go down to Little Rock and go through this archive and can look at all this material and, and, and look at all the things that were going on, that's where the real value is. I mean, obviously, there's there's always the fear that, you know, we're in there all the time and there's different staff, but we overcome, I mean, as a group, we've overcome that pretty quick. I mean, the idea that somebody's gonna limit your access or worry about a picture. I mean, and, and at that level, I mean, you're just, you're taking everything, it's all in the file, it's not released. I mean, it's not gonna go out there all the time. So, but, um, no, it, it's, it's uh, important to get it down. I mean, Pete's got, Obviously, the digital thing, anybody who's involved in photography now knows this extraordinary change that's come about from film to digital. I mean, the millions of images, and it's happening at everybody, and it's, it's, it, I think it's diluted the impact, obviously, of visual media, and it's very difficult for someone to learn photography these days. They, they just create so many images, and they never edit them, and they never get involved in them. I mean, I could go on about <laughs> a couple hours on that one, but anyway, I'll stop. All right. Yeah, right here in the middle. Here, here comes a mic if you, if you want. I'm curious, who owns the copyright on these photographs? Are they in the public domain? You, the people. Yeah, they're all in the public domain. Yeah, uh, ultimately, so I mean, they're controlled in the library. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are co they're co controlled. They, they, there's a couple of little loopholes there. Anything that's ever been published goes immediately into the public domain. All the pictures you see here, the fact that once, the, they can control from the White House whether or not they want to release it. The library can control it, and if, while the President and First Lady are alive, they exercise some control over that process. But ultimately, these pictures all become open. I mean, the files themselves, the archives themselves, there's no restricted folder or anything. So, and, and the, there is no copyright in that sense. I mean, once right. the picture's published, it's in the public domain. Right, and, and for example, if you went to the LBJ Library right now, since President Johnson and Mrs. Johnson you could have total access to Okamoto's archive. But the Presid Presidential Records Act uh, con controls, gives the President and First Lady some controls. You know, uh, Mike Geisinger is here tonight, too, who was interviewed yeah, in the film. Mike, well, Mike put up your hand, stand up. There he yeah, is. He should be up here with us. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> he took one of my favorite presidential photos of uh, uh, Nixon and LBJ together. And um, it's one of the classics. Uh, and he worked with Oki, and right. uh, which was an extraordinary circumstance, uh, certainly. That was a shot on the ranch, I think, Mike, wasn't it? Yeah. What other? Any, yeah, right here in the orange shirt. First of all, I have to embarrass one gentleman in the back, Bill Ingalls, the chief NASA photographer who asked a question earlier who does some amazing work. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, as professionals, not being able to delete product that you are not happy with because everything is saved, um, how do you deal with that? Well, in, in my case, um, like for example, uh, when I had started in the White House, it was all an all film process. And during my time there, uh, I helped convert the White House to digital. And, um, and some people would ask me, okay, do, do you take more pictures because it's digital? And, um, and there's, there, there are definitely trade-offs. But, uh, uh, you know, to, to answer your question, I think that, um, you know, the, the deleting part is something that, uh, you know, I, I ask photographers not, not to do uh, because, 
uh, even the bad ones help you understand exactly the way the photographer saw the situation or what led to a moment. Uh, you know, an autofocus auto picture with someone in the background would, would tell a story. So, I mean, even the outtakes were important to me because they were, uh, especially in the digital age where now all the images are sorted in order. So, for example, you have two cameras and now you can see uh, all the images on one screen in, um, uh, in the order of the capture time, which is extremely important, which would help tell the story and help you understand how the events played out uh, as, you, as you're looking through a story. Well, and for Bob and for me and David, probably, we had all negatives and um, uh, nothing was ever excised from it. So it's the same difference, essentially. Is there any significant part of your photographic records that involved classified material that the public's not likely to see? I, I shot a lot of classified <clears throat> and it became a classified document and, and uh, later on would be once the situation was declassified. A good example was the capturing of the Mayaguez. Uh, was a American cargo ship taken by Khmer Rouge. Um, the pictures I had in the cabinet room with the director of the CIA and all these other people and charts showing when bombing missions were happening. Those were all extremely classified at the time, but after the whole operation was over, the, the, it became declassified. Everybody who worked in the film lab at the time were, they were military people. Everybody had a top secret clearance, so anybody handling any of, of the film uh, what could handle classified material, including myself. And um, uh, I don't know of anything during my period that would be classified still. I think, but Bob, you told me an interesting story about how you kind of got around having to deal with it by kind of keeping your back to it. Uh, not my back, the back, the, the same situation, the, the situation in Somalia, it's, uh, there's a picture in my book that uh, in the cabinet room, it's uh, during the briefings uh, and what kind of a response we were gonna have. And at one point, Tony Lake, who was the National, National Security Advisor and a former uh, CIA uh, person was kind of like, well, I'm a little concerned about pictures of this and I was, and I explained, I said, and the picture in my book, it's from the back of the map of everybody looking at it. I mean, the, the front of the map with the back of everybody's head had no, no real significance to me. You know, I mean, I have uh, Gore leaning over and everybody concerned and the President leaning forward and I'm showing the back of the map. But it, to answer your question at the same time, what David said, uh, our, uh, the photo lab, the, the security there, and the security and the material and everything was extraordinary. And then it, it, it's just, uh, sometimes we, I can remember going into the, uh, the operations center f that monitored all of the submarines and uh, walking in with the president and hearing people talk and, and understanding later they were very concerned that I was in there with, take, with cameras, but I, I didn't take pictures of their equipment or anything. It was focused on the president right. and things like that. David. Well, I, I was going to say, um, uh, w the day that um, um, the uh, Iraqi freedom started and, and, and well, remember Iraq went into Kuwait and President Bush got a world coalition to get them out. And uh, that day, on, on a routine basis, all of us would get a, a daily schedule. But, but on that day, there was no schedule and I was called to the Oval Office. And, and I went into the Oval Office and I was asking the secretary outside, uh, what am I walking into? What am I gonna go photograph? And she said, just go in. And I walk in, door closes behind me. And, and it is hours before uh, the bombing started in Baghdad. And I took some pictures and I was getting ready to leave. And the situation was so highly classified that they wouldn't let me leave. And so I wound up staying in the Oval Office. There's a complex of two or three offices there for hours and hours and hours on end. And, and so I would remove myself from the Oval Office and go into the President's back study. But you know, as, as things changed and later on that evening, uh, back in the back study, uh, the President started calling the world leaders. And so it was great for me but because it was so highly classified and practically no one knew about it. If, Security prisoner. Yeah, so, so you know, once you're exposed, you're there. Yeah. 
Let's see if there are any other. Yeah, right here in the front. Oh, um, I was here. wondering if there. One sec, oh. so everybody can hear you. Are there any special rules for whether you have to be invited into the family's residence? And any special rules about photographing the children who live in the White House? Or is um, they, it's all different for everybody. I mean, for in my case, I had uh, the run of the joint, you know. So I was <laughs> like, yeah, I was a little concerned in this film talking about me going up and having drinks every night, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> and um, but really, <laughs> it actually, was kind of disturbing to me to see that. And that's why I should <laughs> be saying things said it. exactly. Yeah, yeah. You said it. and uh, um, I know, I know. That's like, uh, but. Um, uh, that was, I was, uh, at the end of the day, sometimes it would be 14 hours or so, and going up and um, having a cocktail or whatever would also be part of the job in terms of shooting. But in my case, I, I, my relationship was very close with the, the Ford family as well as the president. And uh, uh, in some, I know, uh, previously to me, uh, the Nixon upstairs was pretty well off limits to Ollie and other photographers. Okamoto had the upstairs-downstairs relationship. Um, that was all part of what really made it work for me, so it was kind of a, it was a total picture of what was going on there. And, um, and I, I was very privileged to have that. And, and again, I, I was, the Fords, neither of them really suffered from a, a vanity. They, they, I had pictures in their bathrobes, and one of the pictures I like best is President Ford uh, in Tokyo, sitting there with his chief of staff, Donald Rumsfeld, and two uh, military aide and a personal aide all uh, wearing suits, and he's in a striped pajamas and a plaid bathrobe, which has probably kept him off the GQ best dress list. But um, moments like that really made it uh, for me about what was going on. One of the things that happens is that there, there is official business going on on the second floor, on the family residence. The president studies there. He makes phone calls. But in my case, I mean, the, the Chelsea was a teenager. That was her home, you know, to run around with her friends. So I only went up on official business. I just didn't wander up there looking for pictures. Uh, if there was something, like I can remember uh, breakfast during NAFTA when uh, President Ford and um, uh, First President Bush and President Carter were up there having breakfast, and I went up. I mean, I felt comfortable going up there, but I just didn't wander up there looking for pictures like I would in the West Wing. You know, I mean, one of the things that, that this, this film captures is, is if you're sitting in your office, you're not making pictures. I mean, I had, a, I had a, actually, David had the best office when he was White House photographer. Then they took that away when I came in, and... Um, then I still had a, you know, we still had a pretty nice office. And then you, got, and did you get the, the, the barbershop? Barber yeah. He yeah. ended up with the barbershop. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. And now it's just, we had a little suite uh, down there. And then David had the wood paneled suite when, when he was there. But they slowly just pushed, uh, kept shutting us down, shutting us down, shutting us down. But, but you don't sit in your office. You wander the West Wing looking for pictures. But you did, we didn't wander up in the residence other than when there was something going on. Yeah, and I only went up to the residence when invited. Um, obviously, there's, uh, just like what Bob said, there were, there were official meetings that happened, and, uh, you know, when they expected you to be there, and then only when the president or the first lady would invite me up. And then something I would also realize, too, is um, just, you know, that when the family would be together and, and, and uh, with President Bush, uh, the girls uh, were away, typically, uh, in, in college, so we didn't really see them that much. So whenever they would appear at the White House, you would really... I would really be protective and uh, uh, very uh, uh, let them be be a family, and then only when I was invited, I would show up. Well, in some ways, it, you're kind of like the family photographer in those instances. I mean, right. you know, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm kind of curious how how often did you see them taking pictures of themselves? Well, you, you know, you know, in, in my situation, uh, literally the first day on the job. I took a, a photo of, uh, this was when I started as the vice president's photographer, took a photo of him meeting his grandson uh, for the first time down in Miami. And I took some pictures and a few days later I get a note from Barbara Bush 
saying, love the photos. If, as long as you take pictures of my grandchildren, you can go anywhere and do anything you want to do. <laughs> so I still have that note. And, and, and for me, uh, you, you know, the, the Bush children were grown up in a way, but there were, I think, showed a photo of all the grandchildren. And so there were a lot of kids around, and, and we have a lot of uh, uh, kid photos, and, and we had some puppies, and so there, there was a lot of stuff. But when, when Millie had her puppies, that was in, in, the, in the beauty shop upstairs, and, uh, you know, so we were on puppy watch you did, in the but, residence. But did you have to ever carry that note around from Barbara Bush and flash it to uh, the No, but I, I, remind, I reminded people about it many times. <laughs> just a, a quick note on yeah. this thing on the second floor, just as a transition moment. The only time I was ever in the Clinton's bedroom was to make a picture that complemented one that David took the exact same day. It was inaugural day in uh, 1993. And David took a picture of President Bush in bed reading the newspapers on inaugural day, and I took a photograph of Mrs. Clinton walking into the same bedroom that evening to, to move oh, in. That's great. That's great. Yeah, so that, 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 I mean, I did not go back in that bedroom again. <laughs> Neither did he, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, things are, things are dissolving quickly here. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, my question has a little bit to do with um, the, the gentleman photographer on the end here, and I'm sorry I forget your name. You were with LBG, I think. But you started talking about some of the favorite photographs that you took, and so my question was what um, favorite photo um, photos have you kept in your, in your own archives? That's a fair question for everybody. I don't think anybody here had uh, worked for LBJ, but it's a great question. Before my time, it's no, hard to the, imagine. The favorite pictures that you've collect, kept, you know, that you kind of, which, well, favorite, which, which you might find hanging in your favorite family. picture of, of from that period, or of your of the administration. Yeah. Oh. Oh, Bush Seniors oh, well. photographer. Yeah, David. Yeah. Do you have? Do you have a favorite one that, you, um, that you've kept? Well, I think, like Pete, it's one you're going to take tomorrow. And, and, you know, I've been fortunate over the years since we've left the White House to meet up with the Bushes on, on several occasions. And, and uh, uh, there's a great photo of him skydiving. So, you know. That's a good, that's a keeper. <laughs> How about you, Eric? Um, there are a lot of photos that I'm, you know, kind of tied, you know, emotionally to, you know, and because and, they, they take me back too. because now that I've had a year, uh, a little more than a year to kind of digest what I've done, um, I have a, like a collection of favorites. And uh, for example, one of the first photos I made uh, in the Oval Office uh, the first week, the president and the vice president checking their watches at the same time. And you know, over time, and just like I said before, when I, as becoming a press photographer and learning to be a White House photographer and learning more about uh, President George W. Bush, I learned that he was timely, and that picture, you know, was reflective of that. Uh, and you know, he he started meetings on time or early, in most of the case early, which I learned pretty quickly. Uh, so, um, but I have I have several favorites, and every time I go back and look at the archive again. Um, I have another favorite that just pops up, and and it's always a memory too, as as well, because you know, experiencing making the picture too, you know, I've, I've become attached to certain mm. images. Mm. Well, historically, I've enjoyed different times. We've done some programs together where we've showed our work, where you get to see a little bit more of our work than you got to see tonight. But one of the things is going back. You do see things you didn't see the first time through, and historically, in the way you. You're feeling, and it changes the way you see the, the, your subject. I mean, that's the imp one of the beauties of, of uh, you know, going back and going through your work and having this, this work accessible. I mean, I, I look forward to, at some point, going down to maybe Little Rock for a few months and just having the ability to go through the, and look at contact sheets and look at a lot of stuff that I didn't, didn't see then. Because uh, you just churn out, you know, as you're doing it every day, uh, even shooting film, you make a lot of pictures. Well, I did a book, um, uh, University of Texas Center for American History, uh, Dolph Briscoe Center for American History, actually, 
um, of 30 years after the fact, and I went back to the Ford Archive and did precisely that. I spent like two or three weeks editing uh, through the material, and um, uh, it was you just see things differently, and you look at all these people uh, 30 years later who were uh, not huge players at the time, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Alan Greenspan, all these uh, all these people who have then gone on to do other things, and um, even some of the situations like uh, one picture, when President Ford died, uh, the New York Times asked me to write a story for their op-ed page about him with the picture that I like best, and I ended up using, the. that, that was a tough question, I, I actually didn't, uh, they'd asked me two years before he died, and, and I couldn't write anything uh, at that time, but I found a picture in the archive when during that Maguez incident, actually, and he had his glasses on top of his head, and I think that picture in the moment was when Ford really assumed command of the presidency, where, where Kissinger, he wasn't relying on Kissinger so much and all that, but he was truly making those decisions. And, um, and the photo, if you looked at it, you'd say, well, that's not that great a shot, but it really has a lot of sig significance to me as an observer of that particular man. Mm. I think, um, Bob, I want to elaborate on a, on a point that you just, you just made, and that is, um, you know, in the, in the film and in, and in the book, we just barely scratch the surface of, of what these guys have done. And um, three of the four have done books. Eric's, I think, working on his book. And I highly recommend that you try to go out and buy, in addition to our book, their books. <laughs> because they really are, Actually, it, they are phenomenal <laughs> collections. Uh, when you go through these books, you see that administration come alive. And, and you're really seeing, you're getting a chance to see something that they've, you know, put their, put their fingers on. And, um, and so I highly recommend that. And, and Eric's, I'm sure, is going to be right up there with these guys when he gets that done. So let's do one more question uh, before we finish up yeah, in the middle. Hi. I'm really interested to know a little bit about the captioning process. Um, you have each individually mentioned a couple of different photographs. Um, that you remembered specifically, you know, you just mentioned something about glasses on the head and what that person was doing at the time. But if you're shooting photographs for such a long period of time every day without working 24 seven, who's really responsible for putting captions on those photographs and when does it happen? How quickly, and because you can forget and then you're going right into well, the where's next Janet? day. Janet. Yeah, where's Janet? Janet. Janet. Where's she is. Janet. Yeah, that's that's Janet. That's Janet Phillips's question. Now she's the woman who, in in my and for those years I was there, she did work so hard and would call me and say, "Okay, last week in the morning, what was going on? What were they?" You know, and I'm like, "I don't remember." And she, no, you got so we. She'd keep after, and you write it on your. We used to write it on film bags. I, now, now I don't. You know, with a digital camera, as you go through, you can't. They do have microphones, but you can't add it as a voiceover on there. I mean, there's just millions of images to have captioned. When, when did you do yeah. it? Well, like, just like you acknowledged Jan Janet, I mean, she, she was the key to everything in terms of tying all the pictures together with keywords, uh, captions, names, uh, working with the White House diarist, and it's extremely important. And uh, the archive itself, uh, the fact that, uh, for example, the during my time, uh, it's the first complete digital archive from, from day one to, to the very finish where you can actually search uh, for, for, for dates, names, important meetings. And, it, and it's extremely important in terms of accessing, uh, you know, over three, nearly four million images, for example, in, in the, that will be in the George W. Bush archive. And it's extremely important that those captions are accurate and, um, and they're going through the images as we speak right now in terms of preparing the, those pictures for the, the final library when, it's, when it is uh, finished. So I- um, Thank you, Janet. Yes. <laughs> that, that is some serious civil service. So um, I want to thank everybody again for coming. Um, as we said, we will um, sign books um, immediately afterward in this lobby here. Um, We'll exit the stage, let the auditorium clear, 
And um, just want to thank you one more time for coming out and um, hope you enjoyed the evening. Thanks so much. <laughs>